Contrary to what the sermon title may have led you to believe, tonight we're not talking about man and woman relationships. And no, we're also not talking about that 70s grungy band kiss with Gene Simmons (laughs) and the face paint and the tongue rolling out and all that. No, KISS is actually an acronym, or the KISS principle is another way to talk about it. And it stands for Keep It Simple Silly. Many of you probably have heard about this, but the thought behind it is that simple systems tend to work the best. There's the least amount of things that can go wrong, the least amount of places that you can get caught up. The KISS principle, or the KISS system, was originally designed or coined by a man uh, named Kelly. And he was working in the military, specifically in the Navy, and designing aircraft for them. And so his thought was he wanted to design the aircraft in such a way that any field mechanic could easily repair the aircraft with only the tools that they would normally carry with themselves. And so he came up with the KISS principle for designing the aircraft. This is something that's taught often in a lot of business schools across the nation, and it's applied in a lot of different areas. This principle is probably the reason that Apple did so well when it first started. Their products were so simple and so user-friendly. Probably goes back to this. Today in our society, though, I think we, we tend to ignore the KISS principle. A couple examples, maybe in the area of weight loss. You all maybe are scrolling through the Yahoo feed that pops up on your, your internet browser, and the highlight comes up, you know, follow this 30-step program and, and this 90-day eating plan, and We'll ship you all the stuff in just 120 days and you'll lose all the weight you ever wanted. Just sign up and go through all these steps. And, and when in reality, if you apply the KISS principle, it's fairly simple. If you want to lose weight, you burn more calories than you take in. Uh, another example are Ruby Goldberg machines. Uh, you guys probably have seen these too. The thought is that there's a light switch across the room and I want to turn out the lights. And so I build this great elaborate machine that starts over here and I knock this ball that goes down a ramp that falls into a bucket that lifts a lever that pushes a balloon in front of a fan that hits some dominoes that does 27 million other steps until something eventually falls on the light switch and turns it off. When in reality, it's much simpler to just walk across the room and turn the light switch off. I think we ignore the KISS principle quite a bit today. And I think there's times, especially reading the scripture, that we wish the authors had known the KISS principle and had applied the KISS principle in their writings. Or even Jesus' life and the things that he says. We wish he would have been a little more clear, a little more easy to understand. Our gospel reading today is one of those times, at least for me, when I started working through it. And I see all of these terms. I see Jesus upholding the law, but as as a Lutheran we say, well, we're not under the law, but why is Jesus saying we can't relax any of the law? And then he says, unless you're more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees, who were the most righteous people of that day, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. But I thought our righteousness wasn't due to works. We weren't supposed to be like the scribes and the Pharisees. And I got really confused, honestly. And so looking through it, I I was kind of at a loss for a place to start. And so I turned to the, the epistle reading for this evening, and I thought, well, let's start there and see if maybe Paul can shed some light on what's going on here. And Paul, at least, I think knew the KISS principle, because he comes to the the city of Corinth, and he says, "I, I decided, I made a conscious decision to preach to you nothing but Christ and Him crucified. See, at this point in his ministry, Paul has been doing the missionary thing for quite a while, And he's been to many different cities with kind of a mixed response. For example, most recently before coming to Corinth, Paul was in Athens. This is the famous scene at the Aragopolis where he's walking around and he sees all the idols and then he says, well, this one's to the unknown God, let me tell you about this. And then he waxes long and very eloquent about how they don't know who this God is, but he knows who they is and he builds this great argument. It's actually a rather striking contrast for Paul because we know he's capable of these great eloquent arguments, these great rhetorical dissertations on Christ. I just, for example, take the book of Romans. It's pretty complicated, it's pretty long, pretty drawn out. But for whatever reason, Paul decides that here in Corinth, he's gonna cut away all the extra stuff and he's just gonna tell the people what they need to know, the very heart, the very center of what they need to know for salvation. And so he comes to Corinth and says, all you need is Christ 
and the work that he did on the cross. It's all you need. And that is the bare bones gospel for Paul. As the bare bones gospel, the center of our faith, the center of everything we preach and teach then, the cross of Christ is the lens through which we interpret the rest of Scripture. And so turning then from the 2 Corinthians passage, keeping in mind that the cross is what we view all of Scripture through, I think if we return to what Jesus is saying, it makes quite a bit more sense. And we see Jesus saying three main things, or telling us three main things, in this short little passage in Matthew. The first is Jesus tells us what his mission is. He says, I came not to abolish the law, not, not to do away with it, but to fulfill it. Essentially, to do what you can't do, what none of us could do. And that's the point of him bringing up the scribes and the Pharisees, because they thought they were righteous under the law. They thought that they had kept the law perfectly, that they had earned their righteousness. As we go through the Sermon on the Mount in the next few weeks, we keep learning about what Jesus has to say about the law and how he shows us that none of us can keep the law. None of us are righteous before God. None of us deserve to be in the kingdom of heaven. And yet when we look at his saying through the lens of the cross, we know that Christ came to fulfill the law in order to go to the cross, in order that his death on the cross might bring righteousness for you and I through faith in him. And so while he says that unless our righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, we can respond, well, in fact, it does. Because Jesus, your righteousness was perfect. You earned your righteousness by keeping the law perfectly. And you've given us your righteousness through what you did on the cross. And so it makes more sense, I think, what Jesus is saying about the law there when we look at it through the view of the cross. So after stating his mission, Jesus then tells us what we're supposed to do and who we are. And so he tells us that, that we're supposed to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. He gives us that righteousness through the cross. And he tells us to be baptized, to have faith in him. But through our baptism then, we are quite literally put to death. The old Adam in us, the part of us that's under the law, is put to death in the waters of baptism, and we're raised to new life. In this new life then, as Christians, in this new life that Christ gives us, he gives us a brand new identity. And so we're no longer living under the law, but rather Christ tells us we're salt and we are light. And I think it's significant to notice also what he doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say, you will become salt and light. No, but rather, as my disciples, as followers of me, as people who have faith in me, People who are righteous because of your faith and because of what I did on the cross, you are salt and you are light. And so everything that you do in your life as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, reflects on Christ and reflects on your life then and your faith in Christ. And so we're called to show the world the light of Christ, to be that lamp on a hill, to reflect Christ into the world around us. How do we do that? Well, Jesus tells us. He says the law is still important. The law doesn't pass away. No longer are we under the law. No longer do we pay the penalty for the law. We don't have to die because of the law because that man was put to death in baptism. But the law and the prophets are still the good, divine, perfect will of God. It's still how he expects people to act in relationship to him and relationship with the world around us. And so Jesus tells us that the law, even though we're not under the curse of the law anymore, is still important for us as a guide to show us how we should live our lives in Christ and in faith. So Jesus tells us then, with that new identity, with the law still meaning something to us, what we're supposed to do with that new identity. And so to be salt and to be light, what does that look like practically for us today? There was a, a lawyer later on in Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, who had much a, a similar question to Jesus. And he comes to Jesus and he says, well, what's the most important law? What's the most important thing I need to follow for my life to be right? And of course, the lawyer was trying to trip up Jesus and get him to say something that they could condemn him for. 
but Jesus answers in a way that puts him to shame, but also tells us how we're to live our lives as salt and light. You're probably familiar with the verse, but Jesus answers and says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second greatest is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus says on, on these two commandments, the entire law, the entire prophets depend. They're summed up in these two commandments. And so to be salt and to be light, to live out our new identity in Christ, is to quite simply keep those two commandments, to love God and to love our neighbor. We're faithful in our calling and our vocation as salt and light when we live out those two commandments. But always remembering the reason why we live them out. We don't live them out so that we're righteousness. We don't follow these commandments so that we earn righteousness or that we do good works so that other people can see us and give glory to us. But rather we do good works so that people would see that it's actually God doing those good works through us and then return that glory to God. We do these good works, we do the things Jesus commands us to do out of love for him, out of praise for him, to give him thanks, and also with the hope that people would see those good works and turn to God as well. And that's what it means to be salt and to be light in the world today. So if we apply the KISS principle to our readings tonight, it's actually fairly simple. We see why Jesus came. To fulfill the law that he would be perfectly righteous, to die on the cross so that we could have his righteousness. And then he tells us what we're to do with that righteousness, uh, to point people to God, to do good works so that people would see God and give God all of that glory. So then this, this week, this month, this season of Epiphany, this entire church here, as we endeavor to live out that calling as salt and light, I pray that the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.